Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Mikola, and uh, I've previously done some work with Plotly, uh, writing uh, big chunks of the WebGL rendering engine that are currently uh, in use for doing all of like the beautiful 3D plots that you see on the web page out there. Um, I am at the moment working at a worker-owned cooperative called uh, Big Island Technology Solutions. We're based out of Hawaii. Uh, so I just flew in last night. I'm pretty jet-lagged. Um, but anyway, enough about that. So uh, here is my GitHub profile. You can find a lot of my stuff on there. Um, but what I'm here to talk about today is this new WebGL rendering system that I've been working on for the last couple of months with the support of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute called Regal. So what is this thing and what is the problem? So I'll, I'll start out by giving you a couple of examples of what you can do with WebGL using Regal. And all of this is running in a web browser, so I'll just kind of go through this. So here's a, a pretty looking crown with some little ripples going on it. Uh, this is a globe rendered uh, in WebGL in a browser. You can even see if I go up here, there's like the URL bar. Um, here is a little sort of art piece. Um, this is uh, about a million particles. It's an audio reactive visualization for like, uh, you know, sort of like a DJ or visual uh, audio type installation. Uh, this is a, a fractal flame function, again, rendered with about a million particles, all in a web browser. Uh, this is a convolutional deep neural network using the MNIS data set. So we can run this, and it does uh, digit recognition. And all of this is running on, in a web browser on the GPU, and all of it is written in Regal. So, and there's a lot more examples. If you go to the Regal web page, you can see these different things on the gallery here. Um, right. So. Those are some things to get started with. So now let me explain what this is all about and how it works, right? So um, broadly, there's sort of two general approaches, I would say. And I'm probably being overly simplistic with this. Uh, when people approach uh, computer graphics or 3D rendering, so the default approach is you grab some canned 3D engine off the shelf, maybe Unity or Unreal Engine, and then you just start you know, configuring that thing, moving bits around, and hacking it to get your project up and running. So the advantage to doing something like that is that you can very quickly get a result. You just you know, load it up, and it's already set up, can draw a couple of boxes or some cubes or whatever, and then you just start tuning those parameters until it kind of does what you want. Uh, disadvantage, though, is that this is less flexible. So if you want to do something really fancy, like maybe one of these crazy renderings that I just showed earlier, or you want to have some custom shader logic going on, then you might end up having to do a lot more work digging into the internals of this system in order to configure it to do what you want to uh, create. And uh, down the road, each of these hacks that you have to do in order to get you know, your product done at whatever milestone you're targeting uh, accumulate. And so this creates maintenance problems years down the road. So. The alternative and what a lot of professional game companies do and people who have, you know, like additional resources or projects that need to be supported for longer periods of time is that they just write their own engine. So then you get something that's tuned exactly to solve the problem that you have. So there's less superfluous junk sitting around. Um, and it becomes easier in some ways to maintain that because you control the entire stack from the user application all the way down to the bottom. Uh, but the cost, though, is that now you have a bunch of duplicated effort, right? So it's sort of this trade-off. If you have a product that you have maybe years of lifetime, you probably are going to end up writing your own thing. And if you have something you just got to knock out right away, like maybe a one-off creative project, maybe you just grab something off the shelf and just, you know, ship it right now. So this situation kind of sucks. And so there's an analogy here to a talk uh, by Rich Hickey uh, where he describes this concept called simple made easy. So the first approach you know, would be sort of the easy thing, right? Where you grab something that's right off the shelf. It's very easy to get started. The second approach is the simple version, right? Where we have you know, understandable, fundamental building blocks that we're putting together. And so what we want to do is make things that are simple and sustainable and good for the long haul easy. So how do we do that for computer graphics? What are the features that we need in order to make computer graphics and 3D engine development simple? So we want to be able to program shaders. We want to be able to get into the geometry in our engine. We don't want some canned pre-baked asset loader that does just gives us a black box that we can then move around and animate. We want to actually be able to grab the polygons and the triangles and the data out of it and be able to generate our own data that we can then feed into it. 
Uh, we want reusable components. So we don't want to keep duplicating stuff. And so that means that we have to have standard interfaces. We want things to be explicit so we don't have a bunch of mysterious configurations that are changing out from underneath us and ill-documented and ill-specified. And we want an open ecosystem where anyone can contribute to it and then add pieces to this. And so we can collectively build the 3D engine that we all need, right, or all the pieces of it. So the idea is that we're going to take this whole concept of a 3D engine and deconstruct it into these constituent little modules, and then everyone can just grab the modules they need to build exactly the 3D engine they want. So that was the idea with StackGL, which was sort of the precursor to Regal. And the goal was to just take computer graphics collectively and just modularize the hell out of it. So deconstruct all 3D engines into like tiny little pieces that you can just snap together like Lego blocks to build your own 3D engine. Um, broadly speaking, there were sort of three classes of modules that existed in StackGL. So we had uh, a set of WebGL wrappers that created an abstraction layer over WebGL itself because writing raw WebGL is an extremely painful and tedious exercise. Uh, we also had GLSLFI, which was basically uh, a module system for WebGL. So essentially this allows you to use NPM style uh, requires in a shader. And this is crucial in order to allow you to create modular shaders. So you can then break down different rendering functions into different subroutines within shaders and snap them all together. And finally, we had a set of mathematics and uh, geometry processing routines that were also open sourced in here for doing things like isosurface extraction, Delaunay triangulation, convex hulls, and computing normals from meshes and so on. So um, that was the high level thing. There are a few lessons. So, Actually, GLSLFI and the mathematics code that was written for StackGL or within this ecosystem uh, was extremely successful and lives on to this day and is still used in tons of projects. So that was really great. But the WebGL wrappers never seemed to quite click in the same way. And part of the problem was that there was a lot of shared state between each of these different components. When you're trying to, say, render you know, something using some subroutine, if it sets a little flag in some funny way, then you call a different one, now you have an undebuggable mess, right? So there's this constant coupling between all of these modules because they're all mutating the same giant WebGL state machine. And also because there's a bunch of these things and they have this common uh, shared state, uh, it becomes really hard to test all of this code. And there's a lack of clear specifications for what each of these things do and all of the side effects that they have. So that just becomes kind of a mess. So this is where Regal comes in. So Regal is basically an attempt to rewrite and redo all of the WebGL stuff that we had, just the wrapper layers, not the shader code that we have already written, and not the mathematics stuff, just redoing the whole WebGL stuff. So the idea, and this is very much inspired by React, is to try to create a functional reactive WebGL wrapper. So we want to minimize shared state as much as it makes sense to do that without compromising on efficiency. We also want this to be reliable, unlike other 3D engines or libraries out there. So we want clear documentation, specification, and unit testing. And also, we want to remove all overhead. So we want something that's as close as possible to what you would get with hand-tuned WebGL code. No performance penalty for doing this. So that's the, that's the objective for Regal. Um, so to explain a little bit about this and why we would want to do this and what it all means, right? Uh, let me first recap a little bit about how most 3D engines work. So a common approach to doing computer graphics is you have something called a scene graph, right? So this is a very uh, ubiquitous abstraction. Many 3D engines, even 2D engines, use the same type of an approach. So um, in something, in a scene graph, you have uh, maybe some root node, which represents the object that's drawable, and then it has references to other nodes, which could be things like materials or objects, and then they're all linked together in some hierarchy. So if you want to uh, animate this thing or connect it to some data, you have this data binding problem where you have to take the state of your application, which is managed by the logic and everything inside it, and you have to connect it to all these different nodes in the graph. So you have this sort of dual write problem where if you want to update a variable in your state, you have to update it there and then also at every point in your scene graph where you're using the same uh, piece of data. So. Uh, some examples of systems that work like this would be uh, like the document object model in a web browser, right? Where you have like a root document node and then every uh, you know, element or tag within this document is some node in this hierarchy. And if you then update a form, you have to then update your data and then update all the places in the tree where it gets changed, right? 
Uh, also, most 3D engines work like this. So 3JS uses a very similar model. So you have materials and objects. Uh, it's the same deal with Unity and uh, pretty much everything out there. So this is the default mode for rendering. So like Angular does things in a similar way. Uh, so to explain now what reactivity is and why we would maybe want to do things a different way, this would be our functional approach, right? the functional programming approach to doing rendering. So rather than having this big, messy, stateful scene object that we're constantly you know, trying to keep in sync with all these other copies of the data, we just write a function that takes the state. We only have one copy of the state, and then it transforms that state into pixels on the screen. And so what we want to do is just make it as simple as possible to write this function. And the way we'll build this function up is we'll just compose together smaller functions in order to build this you know, larger, more complex function that draws the whole thing. So in this way, we don't have this data binding problem because we don't have two copies of the data. There's just one piece of data, and it just goes in one direction out to the user. That's it. So if we kill state, we don't have data binding. And this is like the main innovation in React and why it's been so successful. And similarly, you can see this idea showing up in other systems like Elm or other various uh, uh, front-end libraries. So uh, Regal is basically functional reactive programming for WebGL. And as far as I know, it is actually the first attempt to do so. And so this is kind of the new uh, layout for StackGL post Regal, or at least as I see it going forward, is that we will basically remove all of these old legacy WebGL wrappers and convert them to Regal. So uh, at this point in the talk, I think to make all of this a little more concrete, I'm gonna do a demo and I'm going to live code uh, a example of a uh, Regal application uh, using uh, just the time that I have allotted in this slot. So hopefully this will go well. Hopefully, I'm not gonna make any mistakes over there. Let me just get these windows up there. And can anyone see this? Or is that too small? All right, I'm gonna make the fonts bigger. Okay, so I'm just gonna go walk through how to create a simple 3D scene, a basic 3D engine using Regal from scratch in the time that I have allotted right now. So I'm gonna use a few canned components to get this up and running, but this is actually like pretty much how it goes. So when you wanna render something in Regal, uh, the first thing you do is you load the module, and I'm just doing this using require.js, and this returns a constructor, which I'm calling. So if I do that and I save this here, I now have this Regal instance, which is the functional abstraction over WebGL. And in WebGL, we always do animations, and so what we do is we're gonna give it a callback, which is gonna get executed every frame, and uh, what we'll do now is we'll clear the screen to uh, some color. So let's just make it black. So if we do that, and I save it, and assuming I didn't break anything, uh, I may have to like go restart this. Uh, let me pop that open. Okay, there we go, now it's reloading. So just to test this, I'm gonna change the color of the screen, so now it should be red. Uh, that looks good. We try green, or we could do blue, right? So uh, in WebGL, color values go between zero and one and uh, they are basically in the form red, green, and blue, right? So this is common for shaders and for any other thing. So now I can make something that's like magenta over there. And to verify that this thing is actually running each frame, I'll make the screen flash. So uh, warning right now, if you have epilepsy, you should probably look away, uh, and this may not end well. So let's see what that does. Okay, great, that's really wonderful. Let's not do that anymore. So let's put it back to black. All right, so that's the idea. So, um, I'm also gonna go clear the depth buffer there. So now let's actually do something more interesting than just drawing a crazy flashing screen. Let's draw an object. So, uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to use a pre-built camera. So this thing already handles the uh, camera stuff for us. So I'm gonna do require uh, regal camera. And it's not that complicated what's actually going on in this thing, but to explain it is gonna require me to do a little bit of mathematics that I just don't wanna get into right now in this talk. So what I'm gonna do is give it two parameters into the constructor here, which is basically the center of the camera, which I'm just gonna set to zero, 2.50. 0. So this is basically the X, Y, Z units, and then the distance from the camera will be 40. All right, and now I'm gonna load some data that I can render. So I'm gonna load a mesh uh, which is also stored as a common JS module, and this will give me like basically a Stanford bunny that's gonna be like a little drawable bunny object. 
So I'm now going to create a function called draw bunny. And now this is how we're going to create this thing. So rather than using the normal function constructor, we're going to just call regal, and then we give it this sort of template for a function that we're going to write. So uh, to do this, we give it all of the data that we need to render this thing in this function, right? So this, is, uh, this means that we have to give it some shaders and that we have to give it um, uh, the geometry that we're going to render. So I'll walk through how this works right now. So the first thing is I'm going to write a fragment shader. And I'm going to write a really simple fragment shader, which is just going to render the bunny uh, white, right? So we'll do that for now. And then I'm going to do a vertex shader here. And then this vertex shader will have the same sort of uh, thing. So I'll do precision high P float. Uh, but the vertex, so to recap a little bit, so in WebGL, Fragment shaders tell you what color to make a pixel on the screen, and vertex shaders tell you where to put vertices. So the input to a vertex shader is actually the raw geometry. So here I'm just going to take in the positions of the bunny as an attribute, right? So this attribute variable here is what comes into the vertex shader, and the vertex shader can write out varying variables that then go out to the fragment shader. So I also am going to take in uh, two parameters from the camera which are going to be the projection and view matrices. And these just tell us where the camera is in relation to the scene. And I'm just going to write a really simple function here, which is going to output the position variable as the projection matrix times the view matrix, right? And then uh, times the position vector, all right? So that's, that's all that that is. So that's, that's all the shader code we need for now, right? We can go back and then modify these things and make them fancier. Uh, but that's uh, basically going to take this position data from the bunny, and it's going to write it to a particular location in, three, or in the screen coordinates. So the screen coordinate system in WebGL goes from negative one, negative one in the lower left corner to plus one, plus one in the top right corner. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, it's flipped from the way it works in the DOM. So, uh, we have this position attribute data, and we're just going to read in the bunny positions. And then uh, let's say that the number of vertices we're going to draw is going to be the bunny.positions.length. And we're going to just draw them as points. So let's do it like this. We'll set the primitive to uh, points. So we're just going to draw a bunch of dots here. That's all that this is going to accomplish. And now we have to use that camera. And so uh, what the setup camera does is it basically says, OK, you pass in a function here to set up camera, and then everything within the scope of this thing will get these camera variables that I set over here. So it basically sets up these camera variables for you and reads in the state for the camera and manages that. So now if I do that and then call draw bunny, and assuming it didn't make any typos, I now have a bunch of points that look like a bunny. Cool, and it's all in 3D and I can use that. So the camera, to recap, is basically reading the input in from the uh, keyboard here, and it has its own little internal state variable that it uses to track that. And then it basically sets up this projection and view matrix, which I can now use in my vertex shader, and use that to map the positions there. So um, we could do something like make these points bigger. So I can do something like this. And I can set, OK, the point size to 4. And if I reload, now the points are a little larger. I can make that even bigger than before. Now the points are way big. So if I go in, you can zoom in, see we have a bunch of points, and so on. Uh, similarly, I can make these things colorful. So I'm going to create a varying variable, which we're going to call color. And I'll just set the color equal to the position. So we'll use the position value as the color. And then now in our fragment shader, I can read this color variable that I declared in the vertex shader. And I can just map that out to the actual uh, frag color. So if I do that, now the points here are colored based on the quadrant. And so we can actually get some idea of where, you know, which values are positive and which values are negative. So the values which, of course, they all get so saturated because it's a, you know, very large number. So I can multiply it by, say, something like that. And now we get something that looks maybe more reasonable, right? So those are the colors. Now, suppose I want to fill this thing rather than drawing a bunch of points. Um, I can actually use the faces of the bunny, so the topology of it, to draw the uh, mesh. And I can do this using the elements. Uh, feature in WebGL. So this is handled using this elements property of the command. And now I've got a, a triangulated bunny, which I'm drawing here. So this now is a triangulated mesh. Now what if I want to start putting some lighting on it? Well, then I need to calculate normals on the bunny. But that's not so bad. We already have a module for doing that. So we're going to create this function called compute normals. And I'm just going to load a module from StackGL called angle normals, uh, assuming I have everything installed and configured, which I should. Uh, and I will take a new vec3. We're going to call this normal. And we're just going to set the color equal to the vertex normal. 
I don't need to multiply by that. And now, I'm going to set the normal down here. Well, to compute normals of bunny.cells, bunny.positions. I hope I got the order of that right. All right, yeah, cool. Now the bunny has normals. Neat, right? So we have this uh, colored uh, bunny here, and we could use this to do some lighting. So we can do something like, say, we can take uh, colored, like a really simple lighting approach would be doing something like max of zero and norm color dot y times vec3. And now the thing should look like it's just lit from above, right? As basically a black and white bunny. All right, so that's it, just using like a really simple Garot shaded model. But I think it looked cooler with the normals on it before, so we'll just keep it like that. And maybe what we could do is uh, rescale this so that uh, it's all within the visible range. So we'll do that. And now we got this lit bunny with the uh, colors on it. Okay. Cool, so let's do something else kind of fun with that. So uh, we could make this thing animated. So I'm gonna create this function called warp, and I'm going to take as input uh, vec3 position, and right now I'm just gonna return p, and what I will do is instead of writing out the position value as the output, I'm just gonna output this warped position. So this shouldn't do anything right now. Oh, looks like I got a problem. Well, this is cool, because it's a good opportunity to show one of the other features of Regal, which is that when you have an error, it's actually really great at giving you messages. So right now, it actually tells me which file, and if I click this thing, it takes me right to the line number where I wrote that command. And if I look at the console here, I actually get the line where I made the typo, and it tells me exactly where it is. So it says it doesn't know this function p, right? Well, that's because the value coming in here is actually position not p. So if I fix that and I reload, now we're good. So everything's back to normal and we can continue going on with our business as we were doing before. So let's suppose I want to make the bunny like a little fatter. I could take the normal vector and I can maybe multiply it by say 0.1 and add that in there and now the bunny is like a little fatter. You can maybe multiply it by 0.5 and now it's a lot fatter, right? So now let's make this animated. So I'm going to do uh, I'm going to take this new uniform float value, and I'm going to call it time. And now I can pass in these uniform variables. So uniforms are variables that are broadcast globally to all shaders when you run them. And I'm going to create this new uniform time. And each uniform variable uh, can be defined as a function, so I, or as a property. So for the moment, I'm going to take in a prop. I'll call it prop time. And when I call draw bunny now, I can pass in the time variable to this thing. And I'm just going to do date.now, and I'll multiply it by 0, 0, 001, something like that. Now I've got this time value coming in, but I've got to use this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply by 0 0.25 times cosine of time. Now it'll have a periodic thing, and it should sort of fluctuate between fat and skinny. Actually, maybe that was a little too much, so let's make it a little faster. Uh, we can do it like this, too. So I can also take as input this value called tick here. I'm going to take tick and then just do 0, 1 times tick. All right. All right, there we go. Now it's oscillating. Maybe make that like a little faster. That's too much. Okay. Uh, 0 0.25. All right, whatever. It's kind of like undulating in some kind of crazy way. Let's do 0, 1. Uh, maybe 0 0.1 is okay. All right, so that's like now like a pulsating bunny. That's kind of crazy. Let's not do that too much. Uh, we can now maybe do something like this. Instead of using time, we can add, say, p dot y, and then two times that. And now it'll kind of undulate in some weird ripply way. And I mean, I can just keep going with this stuff all day, right? So I could maybe like do something funny, you know, with like say plus p dot x, and now it's going to be oscillating in some strange direction. And yeah, you can do all kinds of fun things like this. So this is just playing around with the vertex shaders. It's pretty intuitive, and it's fairly safe. But I've only got uh, seven minutes left in this talk, so I think this is enough live coding for now, and hopefully you have the basic idea of how this works. I mean, just to recap, we have props, right, which are basically inputs that come into your functions, and you declare them like that, and you can, you know, pass them in with a struct. So very much in the same vein as React, right, when you're writing these things. Um, okay, so back to the main presentation here. So with the time that I have remaining, uh, I just want to recap what are the main advantages with this. So I've shown what I mean, hopefully, by reactive in the sort of functional reactive sense. 
Uh, but the other two objectives of Regal were to improve reliability and to uh, improve performance. So in the sense uh, that uh, Regal is more reliable, uh, it gives you clear, immediate feedback and error messages if you make a mistake, so you don't have these sort of impossible to debug WebGL things where the screen is black and I don't know what happened, right? So you always get this feedback whenever you change something right away, and if you make a mistake, you can catch it early and fix it soon. Um, it also has well-specified and documented APIs. Oh, I don't have Wi-Fi right here, but if you go on the Regal web page, there is complete documentation for every aspect of the API, and we now have TypeScript bindings too, so if you want to use TypeScript, it just works out of the box at this point, and you get auto-completion for all these things and like type checking even on the commands that you create with Regal. Uh, also, because we have uh, over 40,000 test cases and greater than 95% code coverage on the project and continuous integration uh, on Circle CI, so whenever something changes, you know, it never gets merged unless it you know, passes all the tests, uh, we have uh, a strong commitment to API stability. So you don't have to worry about uh, some new version of Regal coming along and then breaking all your code that you've written on it. So you can write projects that can be maintained for uh, years, potentially, right? So that's the idea. So projects with long life cycles, long running products, uh, can be built on top of Regal and maintained. Um, uh, and also, uh, I should elaborate a little more about how we do testing. So we use a system called Headless GL that I wrote, which is an implementation of WebGL that runs in Node. And this allows you to create a WebGL context without creating a window. So you can actually use this for generating figures or offline renderings and then uh, running them through WebGL. Uh, it's fully conformant to the WebGL test suite, uh, and it's built on top of the Angle uh, library that Google uses in Chrome. So uh, it's pretty solid. Um, okay, and then also uh, performance. So uh, the way Regal achieves all this performance is it uses just-in-time code generation. So I can actually uh, maybe pop back up into one of these things here. So if we look at the code for this, uh, and I go into the source, I'm going to show you something that looks vaguely horrible here. Um, so, but it's kind of cool at the same time. So if I put a breakpoint here on this draw bunny thing, uh, and I'm gonna go back to the window. Well, let me unfull screen this. Oops. Hold on. All right, I have to unfull screen this for a moment. All right, pop up the dev tools. All right, so now if I step into this function, we can see that when I go into this draw call, we have this big mess of code. This is actually what the command looks like that I just wrote. So Regal actually compiled and generated this blob of code that does all of the WebGL setup for you. So the result is that there's actually almost no overhead for any of these things. And we benchmarked it, and I don't have an internet connection, so I can't show you the results. But for every version of Regal, we rerun a whole host of different benchmarks on it. And the overhead compared to something like writing raw WebGL is on the order of around five to 10 microseconds. So it's basically a free abstraction. You don't have to think about uh, performance any more than you would in regular WebGL. In fact, because Regal can do all of this stuff automatically, you're more likely to get better performance using Regal because you could probably make a mistake if you were writing it yourself, whereas if you just use this auto generator, then it's going to create really fast code. So that's how Regal is fast. Uh, and it also has a bunch of hooks for profiling, too. So you can always introspect into each of these things and get stuff like GPU timing on a per-command basis. And you can actually then chart and visualize all of that stuff and uh, look at your results. So you can uh, easily debug performance problems in your applications using Regal. So uh, that's the, the whole thing in a nutshell. Uh, if you want to get involved, you can check out the official website, which is regal.party, which is also the cheapest top-level domain I could find. Or you can go to the, the <laughs> GitHub thing. Uh, or uh, there's also a Gitter website, so yeah. And uh, in terms of acknowledgments, uh, so a lot of the early development in this project was supported by uh, Jeremy Freeman through the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. And so without uh, you know, him and his contributions, this project would not have happened. Uh, and also Urkaman, who uh, jumped in and helped a lot with getting the gallery up and running and built a bunch of examples and had a, an enormous amount of valuable feedback early on in the project. Uh, and Plotly, also for sponsoring this event and also for supporting the development of StackGL, without which Regal would not be possible. And uh, also uh, uh, realize that the other people in the Gitter channel who have like helped out with feedback and my two uh, co-worker owners in Bits, uh, Substack and MK30, uh, for a lot of uh, feedback. Uh, so that's uh, that. Uh, any questions now? <laughs>